Records are able to get together. I'm extremely excited and honored. Today we are here to celebrate Tadashi. He's incredible. He's got a brand new project coming out. Depending on when you're looking at this, it may already be out. Never Fold is the concept. And today we're going to talk about this idea of perseverance. And, and I got to be honest with you, I'm excited because we've got some heavy hitters in the building. Obviously, the critically acclaimed Christian hip hop mogul tadashi is in the building mogul right i just want to say that can i can i predict that ahead of time sure I'll take that and sure. right next to him is mogul. the mogul. the genie can we call him a genie what? can we call you a genie i don't know what that means right. <laughs> He's genie, right? I'm gonna put on that blue paint. Like right. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just listen and hear you out. Right. <laughs> Grammy award-winning artist. You know him. You love him. Um, Lecrae is in the building. Founder of Reach Records. We're honored that you're here. The pioneer of Christian hip hop media. Can I say that? Or is that hey, Sam, somebody you can say else? Whatever you want. DJ Wado was in the building. I appreciate you. Nationally that. syndicated radio host, podcast, TV. Social activist, a little bit. You do a little bit of that. A little bit of that. A little bit of that. Yeah. An incredible music executive. Can we just (laughs) can we take a moment and bow? We just take a moment and bow. (laughs) Um, executive formerly executive vice president of marketing at Motown and you've worked with everybody from Erica Badu to so many folks. You I've heard your name. Outcast. Outcast, come on. There it is. You're a street legend. You're you're a legend in this town. And then last but not least, certainly not least, he's on the front lines. Benjamin Wills is in the building. The founder of Peace Prep. You're you're in you're in the in the trenches. Helping to restore community. You guys are doing some incredible things. Tadashi kick us off. What does never fold mean, man? Never fold is uh, a concept centered around the idea of perseverance, right? Yeah. Uh, it's this idea of never quitting, never giving up, uh, refusing to lose, refusing to stop doing the things that you you feel burdened to do, the things that you know that it, that you were made to do. Um, and so, for me in my own life, uh, there have been several moments, man, where I've just said like I quit. Like, this is it for me. Mm. Uh, whether it was the first time I got hit on the football field uh, in, in seventh grade and snot flew out my nose and I, my vision was blurry, <laughs> my helmet was sideways, and I was like, well, this is it for me. Um, but but choosing to keep going and then uh, from there dealing with whether it's finishing high school or uh, having to give up sports in college, um, deciding to do music, whether I'm going to continue doing that. Uh, and even in my own life, which the album really focuses on heavy, uh, the story of... Of um, me losing my stepmom, mm. uh, me losing my little sister, and then uh, my wife and I losing our one-year-old son. Um, all of that for me were moments where I, I had, um, in my opinion, ample reason, right, to quit, to just say I give up. Um, I give up on God. I give up on life. I give up on family. This is it for me. I'm gonna just retreat. I'm gonna go to Samoa, and I'm just gonna be a dude on the island um, in my lava, lava fishing. So that was my, that was my default. <clears throat> but uh, through um, God's love and grace, uh, through friends and through a ton of different people, um, I chose to keep going, right? Mm-hmm. Persevere. And so the music kind of birthed out of that struggle, that growth, that desire, man. So that's kind of what I wanted to do in this moment, man. Just kind of yeah. discuss perseverance because all of us in this room know what that means. What was interesting to me, one of the things that's huge is the relationship between you and Lecrae. Mm-hmm. From the outside looking in, it's a brotherhood. But we've shared some conversations offline just about some moments in which you needed someone to step in and even help you persevere. And you've shared that Lecrae has been that for you. Lecrae, talk a little bit about that relationship and your idea of perseverance. I don't know what I can say. I, I could, oh, you tell me what I was, <laughs> What, what did I, I say? To what say did about I say? this situation? Nah, man, whatever you want to say, man, it's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I think it's helpful to be honest and be candid and be real and and um, mm. and uh, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is being fully integrated and fully integrated just means like every aspect of your life is, you know, um, somebody has access to it so you don't feel like you're on an island. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Because a lot of times, 
uh, you 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 retreat to your island and you do more damage to yourself than you even realize. And mm-hmm. and uh, and we and I mean everybody sitting in this his room has experienced trauma. You know what I mean, yeah. uh, of some sorts. Yeah. And uh, and I think a lot of times that trauma can make you sit back. And I and I just remember, you know. We've been through a lot of stuff together, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. Yeah. Experienced some some drama and trauma together collectively, mm-hmm. but then there was nothing like uh, that I had been exposed to. Nothing like, you know, I was on the road and I get a phone call from Ted and he's like, "My son is gone." Mm-hmm. He's like, "Chase passed," and I'm just shocked. Like, what are you? What are you talking about? You know, like I don't understand what. What do you mean? You know what I mean. And he was just. Solomon, he was in shock. You could tell, like from his voice, he just was like, he he was in shock, and um, and just over the the series of months, years, even, you know, just seeing that wear on him, and um, you know, to where he just wanted to cope, you know, and numb himself, mm. and and um, and I never forget. I'm gonna be one hundred. Can I be one thousand? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, cool. <laughs> we well, in I, here. But well, listen, I never forget. We had just left the prison. We went to a prison in New York City, and we mm-hmm. went to the prison we was we was sharing, and uh, that was the Rikers. Joint. Rikers. Rikers. We was at yeah. Rikers Island. We yeah. was at Rikers Island. We got back to the hotel, and Ted was like, "Man, I'm just finna sit here and just drink." You mm. know what I'm saying? And I was like, "What you mean?" <laughs> 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 like you just, you know, like this don't sound social. This yeah. sounds like right. coping. Right. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? And right. he was just like, "Man, why would God do this to me?" You know what I'm saying? And I was like, "Okay." Bro, you tripping? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, let me let me be 100 with you, and let me be your friend, and and step in. Because a lot of times you don't, people don't step in in situations like that. They just like, man, I'm gonna pray for you, man. Right, 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 right. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it was like, oh, you hurt, hurt. Yeah. You know, and uh, and you need somebody to lean on. You need real friends, real family, and uh, I think that was. That was a moment of seeing him. Perseverance to me is more uh, I don't know, to not to belabor the point, but it's more. No. It's, it's not just this grit, like yeah, I'm gonna get up and do it. Perseverance is like, yo, I can't do this. I gotta lean on somebody else so that I can keep going. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and have those type of people. And that's one of the things I saw Ted do in that in that situation. So interesting what you said about people will be like, I'm gonna pray for you. Yeah. I think a lot of times people don't know what to say. Yeah, yeah. what to say? I that's think real. we as a society, especially as a culture, we just don't have the tools yeah. to yeah. even recommend to yeah. our brothers and sisters of how to cope. Yeah, yeah. that's good. It just doesn't really exist. Like it we should. ain't been given the tools, no. to especially to deal with trauma at, yeah. at all. So how do you know how to persevere? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. You the expert, Shanti. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> the expert. Yeah, no, Shanti, no. talk about that because being a black woman. Mm-hmm in an industry where there aren't that many black executives Mm -hmm. and you rising to the top, Mm -hmm. how did you persevere? I mean, what? Oh man. Um, so it was, it was interesting for me. I started doing street promotions. Um, so I was handing DJs like yourself, wait, you know, and 12 inch 12 records, inch records of <laughs> yeah. Outcast, Coming to the club, give us the to records to the regular club and yeah. the other clubs, the strip clubs that I didn't particularly want to be a part of. But that yeah. was, you know, what the culture was like in terms of breaking yeah. music in the South. And so oh. I really just, you know, tried to make everybody like my big brother. So I had a college radio show when I went to Syracuse and my nickname was Shoestring. And so mm. I said, you know, I'm gonna give myself a handle. Right. So working in hip hop, I wore a lot of baggy clothes and I tried to divert the attention from you know, men just trying to holler. I mean, men will be men and women will be women. Right? right. And the entertainment industry was a very and still is a social industry. Mm. Um, but sometimes people cross the line. But I always made it a, a point to a situation where people knew that I was there to handle my business. Right. Mm. And so I tried to divert that attention and I just became everybody's little sister. Like even to this day. People that come up to me and they go, shoestring. I know they knew me from when right. I got started, but the mm. respect was always there because they were like, mm. hello, shorty. She always about her business. Yes. She's mm. trying to get the records played. So I tried to draw a hard line in the sand so that people knew like, look, I'm here to promote my records. Yeah. If you want to get down, you want to be with us and you want to help promote our music, fine. But anything else, like I'm really not with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, I was an adult. If I choose to, if I chose to date somebody in the business, it was because I was feeling you and we could hang out, but I didn't want anything from you. So it was no give and take. And I've seen, you know, some women over the years, you know, get in compromising situations mm-hmm. just to get that promotion or that title. And I was mm-hmm. like, I'm not that chick. Yeah. I'm not here for that. I don't want to compromise my That's values. Dope. Right. Mm-hmm. So the perseverance yeah. was hard at times, but 
I kept my eye on the prize. And, you know, I think I'm a more spiritual person now um, at this place in my life. But I always believed in God and always knew the difference, you know, between right or wrong. And I'm not here to place judgment on anybody. Yeah, There's only yeah, one person sure. or being can judge. Yeah. But I just tried to, you know, make sure that my reputation was intact and that yeah. people knew me for my work and not just because I was a, a female working in the business. So we know that the industry can get dark at times. Of course. Um, how did you pull yourself maybe out of those some of those dark moments? So now we're going to take a little pivot from, <laughs> from Shanti, to the record exec, to Shanti the human. Yes. Mm. So what y'all don't know is that my dad took his own life when I was seven months old. Wow. Extremely wow. difficult for my family. I have two siblings, but I was the youngest. And so we buried that shame and we were embarrassed and we didn't really talk about it for a long time. So wow. as a family, the only way that we could persevere was through silence. Yeah. We just didn't talk about it. And we know typically in African-American culture and especially in hip hop and music, you're not going to talk about the negative stuff. And, especially and honestly, coming up, you know, I didn't even really profess my love for God like I should have openly because mm. I didn't want to be perceived corny, yeah. you know, amongst the cool kids in that, the industry. Yeah. And so, you know, I look back on a younger Shanti and I'm embarrassed that I allowed myself to fall victim yeah. to that. But, you know, it was tough for me. And so as I got older and started dealing with you know, um, the stresses of working, you know, in the entertainment industry and trying to climb that upward trajectory of becoming an executive vice president, you know, the politics come into play. So things got tough and life got hard, but I didn't have a lot of healthy coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Similar to what you were saying, Lecrae, those social drinks, yeah, you know, started turning into drinks at home, party of one, yeah. but three or four drinks. Yeah. yeah. That's a problem. Three or four, yeah. it was lightweight. But for me, that was a lot. Was a lot. <laughs> and I and you know, and alcohol is a depressant, right? Yeah, and right, so right. I always felt like, yeah. man, you know, when the going got tough, yeah. would I want to cave in, you know, yeah. and not persevere? And so, you know, I ended up contemplating suicide just mm. three and a half years ago. Yeah. That was the darkest time wow. in my life in 2015. Mm -hmm. And my best friend had taken her own life the year before. And then, you know, I wasn't working at the labels anymore. Life had happened and I had some family members to pass mm -hmm. away. My mom got Alzheimer's. We all know. We all have things mm -hmm. that happen within Told our you family. Trauma in this and room. I did not have the coping mechanisms to handle it. And so I did give up on God at one yeah. time. I thought God was done with my work here mm -hmm. on this earth. I had counted all the pills in my medicine cabinet on a serious note. Wow. And I had pretty much planned out my wow. own funeral. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people see me and they hear my story now and they're like, but you were Shanti Das. Like, okay, but I'm human. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, you know, excited about the idea that I had suicidal ideation and I didn't want to die, but I wanted the pain to go away. Mm -hmm. And so that's how this movement, Silence of Shame, was birthed. Yeah. And I was just doing a radio interview with Ryan Cameron and it just kind of rolled off of my tongue. And then... It was like, whoa, it was like God's kiss on the cheek saying, yeah, yeah. this is your this ministry. Is this yeah. is how you persevere. I'm going to help you and heal you through helping other people. Mm. And so now we have one of the most widely used hashtags around mental health for communities of color. Mm. Lecrae has supported us. Oh, yeah, big time. But that's funny that you say that because I like you, were, you said like you had given up on life to the degree where it's like, I'm going to take myself out. And I, I felt like you got to a place of like I give up too, but you were you did you were gonna just exist without killing yourself like physically. You were just gonna like kill yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote in I, when I did Below Paradise, I wrote a song, Dark Days, Darker Nights, mm -hmm. and in the song I talk about sitting in the kitchen, gripping the steel. So mm -hmm. I'm in Texas. And I'm around a bunch of friends at church who hunt, who go to gun ranges, who are, so they've taken me to several places. And one of them was like, yo, like, here's a gun for you. Like, mm. you, you say you like this. Mm. And I had never, I ain't grow up around guns. Like, that's not us. So when I was sitting at home, I'm like, I got a gun in the house. Nobody's here. Everybody's gone. Um, I basically told my wife, I'm done with you. I basically mm. feel like the lowest I've ever felt. So I'm sitting in my kitchen with it on the table, mm. thinking about ways to do it but not ruin my son's life. My older son is still alive. I'm like, how do I do this but not ruin his life? I couldn't think of a way. Mm -hmm. So like you said, then I just jumped to, well, what what's coping? Coping is them drinks. Coping is um, escape. So I'm going to run away. Whatever I can do to run away. Mm -hmm. So trips, <laughs> random excursions, like, hey, I'll be back and drive to Houston from Dallas or 
get away and go see my mom, go see cousins, whoever. But um, the goal was to to avoid running from ending it because I knew I would ruin my older son's life. Mm-hmm. And I was like, losing his little brother is going to hurt enough. Let me not do more. Mm-hmm. But but it was a real moment. It was yeah. a real place. And you wouldn't be here to tell the story if right. you didn't. Right. So what was that moment? Can we drill down a little bit? I know. I'm about to cry too because you got me. I'm like, Lord, I'm. I got glasses on. I, right. Hey, <laughs> look. Um, but at, what was that moment for you, yeah. where it just clicked and things turned? As far as choosing not to harm myself, I guess coming out of that dark space you were in. Uh, really, it was the, the first that? moment was talking to Lecrae because there was no. Um, you know, like you, you're to yourself and all you have are your own thoughts and you're, you, you're basically internalizing all the shame, all the pain, mm-hmm. all the fear. And so when you have to carry that, that's tremendous, right? Mm-hmm. Like you can't bear that alone. Mm-hmm. So you go, well, um, you, you, you don't have the tools. If people don't have the tools to help you, you kind of lack the tools to know how to reach out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm, I'm struggling to know how to reach out. So I'm, my reaching out was text, like what y'all doing today? But I didn't have the words or the courage to be like, Hey, um, I hate life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> how do you just send that in a text or call somebody and say that? Yeah. Um, so talking with him on the road was the first time I could fully open up and be like, Hey, um, yeah, God, um, God did this. So I hate him. I'm mm-hmm. done with him. Um, as a matter of fact, um, for God to really make this right, uh, he's got to come apologize. Mm-hmm. I need him. To, I need him on his knees saying he's sorry. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I remember. Um, we were at Legacy Conference and you were performing mm-hmm. and I was DJing. Mm-hmm. And so I'm hearing I'm a lot of this. I'm hearing for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember you were on stage and I'm gonna be honest, your set was depressing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm just being honest. He knows what I'm talking I about know exactly though. Tasha, talking about. He knows I we've know talked exactly. about this before. His set was it was depressing, bro. And I remember I had like all your hype records. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, hey, bro. I don't remember what I said on the microphone, but I was just like, I think the people need need want you to do. This, I, I mm-hmm. forgot what it was. Yeah. yeah. But hearing you say all of that, that you were going through makes that moment so much more real yeah. now because it's like, yo, man, like you never know what people are dealing with and you never know like what they need in the moment. And I could even see in your face when we transitioned that music. Yeah. It was like, it was almost like a sigh of relief for you. Mm hmm. But it was just like that was how you were dealing with with everything that you, like obviously we all knew about your son, mm-hmm. but we I didn't know about all this other stuff. And so, it's, so what y'all are talking about, like I not having so it's one thing to not have the tools to know how to ask for help or even the courage, but it's another thing when people don't know how to engage you. Yeah. So what you end up doing as one who's hurt is having to placate and um, somehow. Uh, like make them feel better in their ignorance of how to engage you. So all the pressure falls back on you again. And you're like, what do I do? How do I talk to you? If I got to also carry you, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. So I just won't talk to you. Mm -hmm. So that's why we started silence of shame to educate communities, particularly communities of color on Mm -hmm. how to help each other heal. We don't know how to address each other. I even still now to this day, it's been three and a half years kind of since I've shared my story and, you know, I'm still kind of in recovery, I mm-hmm. think. But I'll run into some of my peers in the business who hadn't seen me and it's like they're like, like tiptoeing yeah. around me. And I'm like, I'm still shanty. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just talk, talk just to talk. me. Like, just, yeah, yeah. okay, you, yeah. you heard about me contemplating killing myself. I'm here. Yeah. You know, God is good. I persevere. Yeah. But like, don't, don't, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And like you said, you have to, you know, bear the brunt of the entire conversation mm-hmm. and all the stress and the pain, but yep. we've got to be okay with not being okay. Yeah. Because yeah. every day ain't perfect. Not every and, day. And when perfect. I tell you everybody goes through something or somebody in their family, yeah. everybody's going through it. We just yeah. got to yeah. learn how to share yeah. and talk about it. Yeah. There's just a lot of historical traumas yes. that, that continue like it's a cycle. You know what I mean? And so I feel like. You you don't address it, you don't talk about it, and then it just gets buried, it gets silenced. And it's the other thing I I I, I dislike, which 
the dope part for you making this this album, mm -hmm. right? Never fold is people don't grasp like when you when you hear someone say they thought about committing suicide or or you know um like Wado was just talking about Tadashi and he didn't realize everything going on around him. You you think about the the single event, but you don't realize that a person still has to function after that moment. You know what I'm saying? And so yeah. it's like even like um Ben, you know, starts a school in one of the worst neighborhoods in all of Atlanta and everyone's there for the fundraiser. Everyone's there for the big moment where we hear about how destitute and messed up this is, the situation is, and then they write the check. They don't realize these kids still got to go back right. to, go back to, to that same envir environment. Yeah. He still got to, like somebody said they saw you at the grocery store with kid, with like six kids. You know what I'm saying? Like I was talking to somebody and he was like, he got six kids. I said, no, them was kids from the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's like he's still outside of school. Right. They Pushy. parents probably couldn't get no groceries. Parents, that's, what it, but that's what I'm saying. So it's like when, for you to create these 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 projects, it's a soundtrack that people can listen to every day mm -hmm. when they have to keep pushing mm -hmm. every day because mm -hmm. people forget. Like right. your son passed, you know, what six years ago? Mm -hmm. That's six years of you still having to push through. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. people think about mm -hmm. it just oh it mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. and then we made it. It's like nah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you don't get over it. You just grow through it. Right. <laughs> right. 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 And we're constantly Retweet. growing. Retweet. Right. You don't get over it. You right. just go through it. Grow, grow through grow. it. Grow. There it is. Yeah. And that's it's, a, why, it's that's a choice you got to make every day. Right. That's yes. the other thing. Like right. when you're, like for me, it's been church hurt. Like I don't know why I keep getting church hurt, but it keeps happening. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. And it's like, huh. it's like huh. every day. Yeah, man. Every day you have to choose, am I going to allow this to be more prevalent in my life mm -hmm. or am I going to Focus on the things that I know God yeah. wants me to focus on mm -hmm. and move forward. And it's, it is literally a choice every day. And it's, sometimes it's a hard choice because you, it's days you don't feel like getting out of bed. It's days you don't feel like talking to people. Yeah. Yeah. It's days you just want to shut everybody out. Yeah. And it's just like, what choice are you going to make today? And that brings me to Ben. Every day you got to choose. Mm -hmm. You are, I mean, you're in the war zone. I'm just going to be. Mm -hmm. You, that, that's where you are. I mean, I, I did work in the inner city for years, and it is so. When you try to get the whole problem diagnosed in your head, you realize, Lord, how am I ever going to get this done? And you're doing it every day. What does perseverance look like in your context? Yeah, I mean, I think it is that it's that daily choice, it's that minute by minute choice to show up and to be faithful and to be um, uniquely who God has created me to be and do everything that I can do out of that place. Um, I think about a mentor I had when I first started teaching and I said, you know, just what's your advice? You can tell me one thing as a young teacher. And he was like, just show up every day. Mm. And I was like, well, that's doesn't seem like great advice, but I'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> like, obviously I'm going to show up every day, but after showing up every day and seeing the difference that it made in the kids' lives, just to keep your word, just mm. to do the things you said you were going to do. And I remember a student saying to me one time after I said something, they said to another student, Oh, that was a Mr. Will's guarantee. And I was like, what is that? And they were like, you do what you say you're going to do. Wow, and that, wow. But that was like out of the context of mm. what they had experienced in their life. Wow. They had experienced adults not doing what they say they're going to do. And so wow. to have someone in their life who would do the things they said they would do meant something for them. So for me, perseverance is about that daily choice to show up, to do what it is God's called you to yeah. do. Yeah. And to do it out of a place of knowing that I'm deeply loved by God, whether I get it all right or not, right? And so, so many of us live out of this false sense of like, God will love me if, or God will love me when, right? And I fight every day to live out of a place of God loves me so, right? So I get to go enter in with his creation and co-labor with him, right? That I get to push back the gates of hell with heaven, right in the context of earth and let people see that and live in that thin space where we say, if we're not here, then no one's going to do this, right? Yeah. Like there's not like somebody else coming yep. behind us. Mm -hmm. If we don't do this, that these stories will never be told. These people will never be known. This situation will not change. And that's not to say that we are the saviors or we are the heroes, but it is to say that we were created by the creator of the universe and he's given us the tools to subdue darkness. Mm -hmm. And we should do that, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And we should do it every day. And there yeah. should not be a day that we 
uh, go by that we don't do it. And so it just changes the way that you engage with people when you know what it is you're there to do and who it is that's that sent you there to do it. You just said Ooh. a word. Ooh. I feel like we need to pass the collection plate. Right, 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 right. Spirit fingers, right? Um, I'm going to shift this for a second. I think everybody can jump in on this, but I'm going to leverage a situation in Lecrae's life um, that you can speak to. Um, because I feel like we recently, I don't know if it was recent, but it seems like it was recent. We saw you persevere in real time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We saw you persevere in real time and and honestly, I mean you were carrying a lot of us on your back, for we'll be honest. I mean you you had the courage to exist publicly and to emote publicly and to persevere publicly and then to transition and you're smiling we're like, whoa. Um and really that was during that time it, it was a big shift in the church. Um I remember when the the white cop got shot in Dallas, and then everything stopped. Because mm -hmm. it was, I mean, there were tremors of people and both sides going, all right, hold on, we got to talk about this. And they'll say, well, is it this? And let's look at the facts and all these things. Then the white cop gets shot and the church stops. Mm -hmm. And it was right at the apex of your moment of going, wait a minute, I'm trying to emote about an experience that I'm having as a black man in America. Yep. And nobody... Nobody gets it. The people that I think should get it don't get it. And wait, and then we see Piper come and he's dropping stuff. And it's just like this. It's like the church is just up and up. And, and you see it from your side as well. Um, talk about that. How did you persevere through that to be where you are now? I mean, we got the Unashamed Tour coming. I mean, it's. Yeah. No, I mean, honestly, it's like it is the collection of people that you can lean on in that, in those times. Um, and I feel like God strategically put people in my life because it was dark. It was it, like, it was the darkest time of my entire life. Mm. So not like I done been molested. I done been beat down. I've been locked in trunks, guns pulled out on me. This was the darkest time of my life that you can skip all that. My pops left me. You can skip all that. Mm. These from 15 to 17, 18 darkest time of my life yeah. darkest hands down so mm. but you know what i have to reference is i have a, a friend who who literally lost his son i look at my son and i'm just like yo what would i don't know how i could what would i do and then i'm seeing him wrestle and push through and process you know what i'm saying and uh and then i'm i'm you know I'm seeing other people in the same way. Like it was, you know, so that was, it was a faint light at the end of the tunnel, but it wasn't, but it was a light, <laughs> you know, it was faint. It was real, real tiny. You know what I'm saying? I was like, yo, it, it, you know, even like with Shanti and Silas, the shame is like, like I'm a part of this, not because I support this, not because it's great. It's because I need it. You know, mm. I need to hear these voices. I need to hear other people who've experienced this type of darkness. And it's something like, like I couldn't even explain to you, but, um, mm. but it's, it, it's just, you know, in these moments, it's like when you hear verses like consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, like you can say that until you in a real truck, like <laughs> in it. you can say that you say that when you, yeah, oh man, you know, Oh, it's traffic today. Consider it pure joy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, fam. No. We talking about death. We talking about divorces. We talking about, you know, your brain shut down. You depressed and anxious. Mm -hmm. Like you, you literally, you, you don't even know who you are. You thinking you're going crazy because you getting death threats and pe you like, who is God? Where's God? And yeah. it's like, and all I have is, my crew. My wife was like, yo, I can't. Like, <laughs> like, you need to talk to your, like, I don't know how to even help you. You know mm. what I'm saying? In this situation. So, all that to say, I had to consider it pure joy when I faced trials of various kinds because I knew that it was producing something in me. And I just had to remember, God, you're trying to do something mm. in this process. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to remember. Like, I, I, I would literally think about, you know, 
women with multiple kids, right? And you and after the first kid, they'll tell you to say, "This is the worst pain in the world. I don't know what in the world. I thought I, I thought I was dying giving birth to this child." But when they're holding a the child, they're like, "God, this is what mm. this is what I went through all of that for, right?" Mm. And then you know that it's worth it because then they turn around and do it again and again and again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so in that, it just it, it helped me. To push through just thinking like you don't quit. You don't see you don't quit during labor. I'm not a woman. I can't tell you how right. much pain that is, but right. I've heard the testimonies. Yeah. You don't quit during labor. You don't say, ah oh, nah, I'm sorry, doc. I'm out. Mm. You know, baby's done. It's like, no, you know there's a result that is being birthed. And I think that's what I had to lean on, is like there's a result being birthed. And when you see it time and time again, when you can see Shanti on the other side of her pain and her turmoil, when you see Ben go to work every day, when I see Tadashi making this album, I ain't, like the way they was saying, not only was that show depressing, like Below Paradise was a depressing project, bro. That was a tough one. Yeah, very much it's right. my least favorite Tadashi album, straight up, <laughs> like hands down. But to see him make no, this, he was performing songs from Below Paradise. That's what it was. <laughs> no, I remember this. I remember the moment. I remember the moment when you when you switched. It. And in my heart, I was like, come on, man, I don't want to do this. Yeah. And then you did it, and it felt right. I was yeah. like, okay, thank yeah, you, Wade. Yeah, I, thank you, bro. I said, we need the old Tadashi. Yeah, we need some throwbacks. Bruh. We need some throwbacks. But now you just made the best album I, I feel like you ever oh, made. God, mm. God flakes. Woo! So, thank and you. do you know how, I, I hope y'all brothers understand how important this conversation is right now. Yeah. Tell us. Because where we are, please. just in terms of even just being in America, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Our leadership within our nation, yeah. what's still going on in terms of you know, our men being afraid, you know, of police officers. And yes, I know all police officers aren't bad, but mm -hmm. we still know, you know, the trauma that exists with yeah. that relationship, right, within yes. the community. And then just the trauma that our men are experiencing and it's unfolding back to your point right before our eyes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, whether they're in entertainment or, you know, other industries, like men have got to be okay with opening up and sharing. Yep. So yeah. this conversation the fact that you are like video recording this talk and putting it out there, we mm -hmm. gotta keep having these type of conversations. Yeah. The vulnerability, yeah. mm -hmm. the fact that you're wiping yeah. a tear from your eye, yeah. like men yeah. don't cry. Mm -hmm. We're not taught yeah. that mm -hmm. in our society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're taught yeah. not to cry, and yeah. especially yeah. women. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm grateful to have the seat at the table today, but women definitely can't cry. Mm. But guess what? When you go on my Instagram, which is the highlight reel that I like to call it, right. you're not going to see all peaches and cream. Right. Here we go. I'm gonna show you my bad days and my scars. Yeah. And the more that our men can start opening up yeah. and get to a place of healing yeah. from a perseverance standpoint, mm -hmm. I think the better that we'll all be, whether it's in the faith community, you know, people in other communities, like we yeah. have to start talking and sharing and yeah. being okay and showing that side of us mm -hmm. yeah. because we go through so much. But if we keep it all bottled up inside and, you know, we don't address it head on, then you're going to see more people having shorter lifespans. Yeah. And so yeah. many people hurting in our nation. Mental yeah. breakdown. Yeah, Absolutely. What, mental breakdown. I think one thing that's that's really dope about this conversation, nobody here is bitter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's like we've all been through different things to varying degrees. And you used to put this on your Twitter. You tweeted it a few times. Don't allow it to make you bitter. You allow it to make you better. That's right. And I think just off of what you were saying, people need to understand that's the goal. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. It can't be, hey, this happened, and I'm just going to stay here in this in depression, the this funk, that's this right. whatever. It's like, nah, God took me through this yes. to learn something. He was yeah. preparing me for something, even when we don't understand it. Yeah. Even when we don't get it in the moment, mm -hmm. there's something that God wants us to take yes. from that, that experience that... I mean, maybe it's to minister to somebody else. Absolutely. Sometimes it's just that simple. Sometimes it's to keep us from something that would have been even more harmful. Mm -hmm. You had to have this pain that's an eight, but yo, you could have had a pain that's a 10. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Like yeah. sometimes it's that. So, you know, I mean, we, I think sometimes we just got to look at these things from just a certain type of perspective yeah. of what does God really want us to get out of this? And yeah. how can it be beneficial to and other people? And that's called recovery. Yeah. You know, we're yeah. all still recovering from yeah. the scars in our lives. Yeah. Each and every one of us. 
That's what I feel like. Yeah. Well, we it's funny because we we're close. So we've been journeying together. That's why I want y'all to hear the project too. This is not even no no push, no pub. No, no, no. But because of our relationship, like like I've like we talk about going to therapy and counseling all the time. Like we've met with the same. I got, I got an appointment this afternoon. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm but, every two weeks. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah. so my budget. Yeah. What what like this like I'll let you talk about right, it, but it's just a line what on the it's budget. A line item. Facts. <laughs> but I'll let you talk about it, but just like that, I feel like that's what you're gonna listen to. What people are gonna listen to? They're gonna listen to Tadashi Huda has some therapy. Mm-hmm, <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, but Low Paradise was definitely my lament. Um, the you one thing, that, yeah, I needed you that. I needed that. that. It was therapeutic. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I talk about with my wife all the time is that we, at least in my experience with the American Church, um, we've lost the art of of how to lament. Mm. The ability to really lament um, scriptures. What that mean? The scri- what that mean? What that mean? <laughs> Come on, man! Everybody watching Ash this, they know <laughs> it is. Ash- like the the ability to to take moments of sorrow and embrace them, engage them, to to really, in a sense, revere the Lord in them. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't learned how to do that. We've instead been given um, celebratory moments so much that when these moments come, they feel like interruptions. Mm-hmm. Um, when if you can step back and look at the span of life, if I walk through English Ave um, on a daily, there's. There's not a lot of celebrations taking place. There's there's not a lot of there are people who deserve to be celebrated, and I think Peace Prep is doing that in various ways. But I think ultimately there is still this place where you go, nah. Celebrations are welcomed interruptions to my moments of lament, which seem to be frequent. Um, so in working on the album, there was moments where I was like, okay, I could turn a corner here <laughs> and go back to. Um, to the things that that I, I definitely thought in those moments of lament, um, but now I'll give you sober perspective in the lament, mm. um, the growing through, if you will. Like I wanna, I wanna make sure that I'm giving you a grand mm-hmm. or or macro image of what I've had to go through to get to this place of health, to even have the language or, and the courage to talk in this way. Um, I, I was reading this one book and. Um, um, it's called um, um, The Body Keeps the Score. And so it just talks about how um, how trauma affects us physically, and your body remembers that. Um, and this one particular psychiatrist was talking to a Vietnam war vet, mm. and, and he said, here's meds. Take your meds, and you'll be fine. And the guy came back two weeks later, only to realize he never took the meds. He threw them out. And he was like, why did you throw your meds out? And as a doctor, I'm upset. Why would you do that? And he said, well, if you if I take the meds, my dreams stop. If my dreams stop, I never see my friends again. If I don't see my friends anymore, it's like I don't. Li- it's like they never existed. Sheesh. And and the doctor's like, but why would you live for the dead? That's so confusing to me. But he he hadn't had the experience of knowing them, sharing life with them, going to war with them, mm-hmm. and then coming away as the one who survived. Mm-hmm. And so <clears throat> for me. Um, on stage performing the sad, depressing set. It's like my music has to stay this way because um, to move past that is to forget him, mm. to ignore him, mm. to pretend like he wasn't here. Yeah. And I was like, no, music has to do that. But this album is the first moment where I've had clarity and courage to still consider what I've gone through, um, but not feel like it should dictate every moment. Ooh, um, that's so good. that's, but that's, that's been a, four-year journey <laughs> i can relate to that just mm-hmm. on a smaller scale uh, if i can share Please. a couple weeks ago i went out to la for the grammys yeah you know i hadn't really been in the mix as much and i don't get invited to all the fancy events like i used to but a good friend of mine got me on the list for the rock nation brunch hey that's the event if you get the one you got to the one right? <laughs> when you see people risk it all for the jay-z picture <laughs> Risk it all. <laughs> so, you know, shout out to Rock Nation, JB, and all the work that they do. But on a right. serious note, yeah. um, you know, I really didn't have the clothes to, to go. You mm-hmm. know, everybody, that brunch is, you know, everybody's all done up in their uh, Sunday best, if you will. And mm-hmm. I, you know, nowadays I'm shoestring. I'm usually rocking sneakers or some STS gear. But anyway, so when I found out I was going that morning, I had this inner turmoil going on and I was like, Lord, why, why can't I find a peace and calm about me? So I rushed to get my hair done. I was at the mall 
trying to find something to wear. And of course, everything's like three, four hundred dollars. I was like, I don't really have three, four hundred dollars to spend on an outfit. And I'm stressing. But God just came to me and was like, stop, like, yeah. stop, stop, cut it out. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and was like, just go with whatever you have in mm. your closet mm. or in your suitcase and make that work. And then mm. when I got there, it was the first time that I had seen J and B and some of my other former colleagues. And I was like scared to death when I first walked in. And then God just placed this calm mm. over me wow. and was like, be okay with what you've just experienced mm-hmm. in these last four That's years. Mm-hmm. That's deep. Y'all, I can't even explain that feeling. And mm. I walked in with my head held high. Everybody else was in dresses and frilly clothes and Giuseppe's. I had on some black pants, some boots, and a you know, and a sweatshirt. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a little dressy sweatshirt, but yeah. still, I wasn't yeah. all fancy. But I had God on my side, yeah. Yeah. so the Holy Spirit was like w- rocking with me right in the room, and yeah. it was the first time I felt okay around my peers. Wow! After mm-hmm. wanting to take my own That's life, amazing. Wow. to be back in that room as Shanti Das, twenty-five right. year music yep. industry veteran. That's amazing. I right. came up with these people, but I was embarrassed. Yes. And God had to work through me and go, look, one, this is your ministry. This is who you are. But you're still the same girl that you mm-hmm. were, that yeah. I birthed you to become. Yeah. Like, don't you dare let your scars hold you back from walking in this room and being yeah. proud of who you are. You and I walked in and had such an amazing time, business. though. <laughs> and I was okay. And you could even see in some of the pictures, like, the, the joy on my face was like, wow, it's it was so freeing. Yeah. Man. For the yep. first time yep. to be back with all of my folks and feel good about what I had gone through. Man. And look Boy, at the look. event. But look at the, he took you to the event to do that. Yeah. He didn't have you at no little mi- minor event, <laughs> no small <laughs> event. You're not, you're not gonna, and you're I gotta... really didn't think I was getting into that. And I honestly was afraid to go. That's the place. Because I didn't know them. how I would handle it. That's a real faith walk, mm-hmm. right? Like it's not a faith walk if I'm. Man, I'm nervous to go to my family reunion and I ain't got on what they're going to have on. Like right. to sit there. Different. You ain't got the t-shirt. You ain't got the t-shirt. You walk in that other room. No, that's, and I that's shared real. with Jay, like, Jay, I don't know if you know, but, like, I contemplate taking my own life. But I spoke those words. I wow. brought those words to life yeah, in that yeah, in that moment. Good, and man. I wasn't embarrassed. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And guess that's what amazing. he said immediately? He said, wow. oh, man, I'm, I'm glad, you know, to hear that you're doing good. I want you to meet Dr. Jess, who is a psychiatrist friend of his. He wow. immediately didn't judge me right. and connected me or with the ministry. Or dismiss you. Right. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, God, you got it. Right. Mm. Because that's attractive. Got it. That's what people want to be around. They want to be around that level of security. Because it, it, especially in the industry, right, yeah. it's like shame is the, oh, the driver. What? It's the driver. It's the driver for that. It's like... Um, and I and I'm I'm in recovery from all of that still, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But um, and that's a whole nother podcast video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we ain't got time, but that's the crazy next album. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Right, right. Nah, but 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 like you said, like um, you know, I'm sitting in my with, with my counselor, my therapist, and he's talking about just these these um these uh guys in Afghanistan, the military, American military in Afghanistan and their, and their, their trucks are getting blown up. Mm-hmm. And so they start taking scrap metal and welding it to the bottom of the trucks. And the government says, y'all got to take that off because we didn't design them for that. And the the, the, the soldiers are like, yo, you, you, you come out here then mm-hmm. you deal with this. And, um, and so there's this conflict, but, but the point he was trying to make for me was, you know, a lot of the trauma that you've experienced has made you question your identity and your worth. And so you are welding on mm. pieces mm, yes. like plaques and affirmation onto yourself so that you can feel approved of when that's not how that's not government issue. That's not God issue. Mm-hmm. He can send you something else that will better fit, but you going to take it into your own hands to try to weld it to, to make it work. Yeah. And that's not what you were created for. So every time you, you, you walk into the meetings and to the rock nation brunch, it's like, do I got my armor on? Am I got do I do I fit? And you're questioning your position in this space, and it's like we all just mm. human. Yeah, yeah. That's it. you know what I'm saying. That's so it. listen, as we round third base, um, we, we've got our white brothers and sisters watching, yeah. Hispanic all around. I want to take a moment and talk about counseling, yeah, and demystify it for a second. What role? Because what I hear all around the room and I'm, I happen to be sitting in the host seat today, but if I was in your seat, I'd be like, well, here's what my counselor said, and then this happened, and this happened. Um, 
But what I'm hearing is that in your time of trouble and darkness, which we all have, there was some personal work that everybody did individually. Um, and we all do. Our, and a lot of that personal work happens in counseling. It happens with brothers and sisters. What role does counseling and therapy play in having perseverance in dark times? No, please share. Well, I, I, I'll just start initially because this, yeah. is, this is about you and, and the new album. But, you know, counseling and therapy is so important. Yes. yes. You know, for, for years and years and years, we've been told in our African-American community that counseling is for white people. Yep. Yeah. We, that is the farthest yeah. thing yep. from the, the truth. the farthest thing. Okay. We sometimes need someone that's objective and that can stand outside of our lives and give us an honest approach of what we're going through. And I'll be honest, not every counselor or therapist is the right one. Good. I say tell that. people sometimes, not that I'm on Tinder, but it's like you got to swipe a couple times, <laughs> you know, take a couple of appointments until you find the right one, even with yes. your general practitioner. Yes. She said swipe a couple times. Every doctor might not be the best doctor, right? Right. right? But the idea of just knowing that we have someone that can help us through, you know, we, we got to be able to talk. And so when we go through this trauma, like you said, we shut down, right? Yeah. yeah. And we remove ourselves from society, from our loved ones, from our family, and we draw from within. But you got to be okay with talking to someone. So there are online therapists that are available. There, you know, so many people say, oh, I can't afford therapy. Well, there's therapy out there for you, right? There are a lot of therapists local in local cities that charge by a sliding scale based mm -hmm. on what you make. Wow. Or there are hospitals that offer therapy. Or there's, um, you know, apps churches, now. Churches. Churches have in-house counseling centers. Yeah. You know, it's just so many options that are available. But just know that therapy is actually a good thing if you allow it to work. And sometimes you may need medication. Yep. A lot of people don't know that a psychologist cannot prescribe medication. Right. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor. They mm. actually go to med school and they can prescribe medication. But mm. once you see your psychiatrist and they can diagnose you, then you need to follow up with a talk therapist, someone that you can see on a regular basis and they can monitor your progress. Because we guess what? It's just an accountability partner. Yeah. Yep. You we That's all need accountability. Yeah. And for me, it was my ego. My yeah, ego say, kept it. me, and I'll throw it to you. Yeah. My ego kept me from getting therapy for a long time. And it was yeah. the worst thing I could have ever done. <laughs> nah, but also like what she's saying, ego is the biggest problem. You know what I'm saying? It's like we, we need to demystify medication. We need to demystify meditation. We need to demystify, yeah. you know, sitting in somebody's chair because it's all about are you well? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's not like some people are like, yo, man, should I take meds or should I not take meds? Are you well? Should I meditate? Not meditate? Is it okay? Especially like in 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 in, in the faith based circles, it's like all that stuff sounds like the witch at indoor. It's like I don't right. mess with all that, b. And it's like, man, you you took an epidural when you right. gave birth, didn't you? You took Tylenol when you yeah. got a headache, don't yeah. you? You know what I'm saying? Or you know, uh, you you do breathing exercises for the Lam Lamaz classes or whatever. So it's like. Yeah. Breathe and meditate. meditate. Take a yeah, pill. God gave people the ability, exactly. hello, to that's become it. those mental no, health professionals. Good. Exactly. Good. I think for me, it's one of the most critical components of my life is seeing a counselor regularly. And I sort of re-engage with counseling after a season away from it, pridefully thinking like, I really just want to have some something in place as like a safety net. Like I just mm -hmm. want to have somebody to talk to where I'll feel good, kind of get some things off my chest, but I don't really like need to be here. Mm -hmm. And then five minutes in, I'm like, I'm going to be here forever. <laughs> <laughs> There's, like there's just there's just not good there's not an end to this right and so for me i was like yeah prevention's worth a pound of cure you know going into it and now i really see it as there's so much stuff that i still have to deal with from years and years and years and years and i tell my wife this all the time i'm like i didn't I intentionally didn't feel anything for 30 plus years. Like mm. I'm, I'm going to, it's going to take a long time for me to figure out how to be okay feeling things and, and how to talk about them and name them and mm. how to strategize around them and whatever it is. And so this isn't like, Oh, you're going to go five times and you're going to be good for me. This is like, this is a conscious decision uh, of being fully holistic and healthy in mm. life. Um, and to your point about people saying like they can't afford it. I'm the corny person who will say like 
you can't not afford it. Like yeah. you need to do. Like yeah. there's something you do. And that's not corny. Yeah, like there's there's something you can stop doing, right? Like there's yeah. something you can stop doing in order to make space for this and prioritize this because if yeah. this isn't a part of how you're caring for yourself, That's then right. then you're not tending your soul well. And, right. and really, uh, it's a stewardship. I mean, it's a stewardship issue. You're not stewarding the influence God's given you or the personhood God's given you mm. as being made in his creation yeah. if you're not caring for it, if you're Absolutely. not saying... I need someone to tend to this area of my life that's a professional that's looking at this from an angle that I'm not looking at it. Um, and even just, just the, the practice of regularly doing it, the rhythm of regularly doing yeah. it mm-hmm. gives us a, another language and it gives us another tool to then be in relationship with other people, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, mm-hmm. one of the things I tell people all the time is you cannot give away what you don't have. Yeah. So if you're not whole, you can't That's give good. away wholeness, right? And so you're trying to minister to someone, you're trying to pastor someone. Yep. You need to be ministered to. You need to be pastored. You need yep. to be cared for. Yep. Um, or your influence is, is going to be about this deep and it's going to run out and people are going to smell it all over you and mm. start to move backwards instead of forwards towards you. When the airplane's going down, what do they tell you? Put your mask on mm-hmm. who? Yourself, yourself first. first. Yeah. 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 Then you can yeah. help other yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing as relates to your life and therapy. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think for yeah. me, one, one of my challenges is I internalize a lot of other people's dramas and stuff too mm-hmm. because I'm always trying to help people. <clears throat> and it's like, sometimes I got to go somewhere and just get that stuff yeah. out. out mm-hmm. And allow that to, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Yeah. Because if that consumes you, I don't have any more space to help anybody else or to even deal with my own stuff. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't know how to fight for that. Yeah. I didn't know how to fight for yeah. finding those spaces. Yeah. So counseling for me was that space. I didn't know. Yeah. I had, you know, there's some stigma. There's some idea of, well, you know, that's for white people or, you know, that's for, that's for, <laughs> that's, yeah. Or that's for people who really bad, like who really got it bad. <laughs> like, hey, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to go, I'll hit my homeboy up or I'll read something or I'll do whatever I was trained to do as uh, someone who wants to be educated. Let me go read or let me go uh, listen to this podcast. Let me go do something else. Um, and really, I'm, I'm really just kind of trying to put a Band-Aid over mm-hmm. what, I, what needs medical attention. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I went to counseling, I tell everybody, like, counseling saved my marriage. Counseling saved my sanity. Yes. Counseling was the first place that I cried without my wife, with, with someone else besides my wife in the room. Mm. It was the first time I really cried mm. and said, oh, I... I'm, this is, this, I got the entire, and of course the shame is there because the entire time I'm like, I'm sorry, man, hold on a second. <laughs> I'm sorry, man, hold on a second. You know, and really, really trying to deal yeah. with it, but yeah. it was the first place where I could really open up and say, this is what I'm really dealing with. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it provided, um, a rhythm and a safe space enough that I acquired the language to communicate my emotions yeah. versus, not knowing what to say and then it all being pent up inside, internalizing it, um, holding it and then feeling that pressure at the top of my head yeah. <laughs> where it's like, all right, I'm, I'm fighting everything internally. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Um, so I just screamed on this person that cut me off mm-hmm. or I just like went to the gym and, and worked out for three hours when I only need to do an hour <laughs> or I, oh yeah, bro, there's been many a moments of yelling at people who didn't deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> later coming back like, I am so sorry, y'all. My bad. And then you, you don't think about it because you're just in the moment and then having like to exist in that new issue because Mm -hmm. I'm not a little person so if I show up yelling at people (laughs) it's a different motion or it's a different experience it's a different it's just some it's a big time on dude over here it's a different space bro so ultimately for me I'm I'm like counseling therapy has been phenomenal man and then to have somebody objectively speak into your situation um, because whether we realize it or not um there are there's a narrative that you've started to tell yourself mm-hmm. that you believe about your pain, your 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 mm-hmm. trauma, about your hurts, and there may be truth to that narrative, but you've created a narrative in addition to that that you may not be aware of that yeah. someone objectively outside of yourself mm-hmm. can see and speak into. So I've I see that in my own self where I go. Okay, all right, it's March. March is the month my son passed. It's also the month his birthday is in. So all of that for me is like, ooh, this is a big month. Um, so in that, when someone, when someone doesn't 
who's close to me or someone who was there doesn't remember or doesn't say anything. The initial narrative was like, oh, well, you don't care. Um, so I'm gonna scream on you. I'm gonna dismiss you. Um, but to have the moment, the, the wherewithal because of counseling, because of therapy, because of an, an objective opinion to present a different narrative, one that's probably more couched in reality, um, then I have an opportunity to have a different voice, um, a different opinion. And what that does is provide hope. Yeah. Um, for at least three years, I live hopeless. Mm. Like any day now, I'm gone. Any day. But there's hope. There's like real hope you can have. So I remember yeah. them text messages. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, just want to add lastly that, you know, people should look at counseling and therapy as not only treatment, because, we, you know, we do at some point grow through mm -hmm. what we've gone through. We may not necessarily be done with it, but we find that we get to the other side or there's that light at the end of the tunnel. But therapy should be self-care. Mm -hmm. Right. Like for me, even the work that I'm doing, it's heavy, y'all. Mm -hmm. yep. Rehashing the fact that, you know, I had suicidal ideation. And then now, mm -hmm. you know, I have so many even personal friends that I get DMs and texts like, oh, can you help my my daughter or my son or my loved one? And so I always try to be available, but I'm still going through it. And it was my pastor, Dr. Raphael G. Warnock of Ebenezer, that was like, nice. you're the wounded healer. Yeah. So you still need healing. Oh, yes. the wounded, the wounded healer. healer. And he, he didn't coin that phrase. You can Google it. It's been out yeah. there. But yeah. I feel like the oh, wounded healer. Yeah. So like, guess what? Oh. I still need therapy as a That's part of self-care. And self care self can care. be therapy. It can be working out. It can be meditation. Yeah, meditation. It can be yoga. It's mental hygiene. It yeah. is hygiene. anything that kind of puts you in a better mood. And so, you know, we at Silence of Shame, we have these Silence of Shame self care Saturday activities. Mm -hmm. So we do cooking classes. We have people working us That's out. Good. And so you got to incorporate, you know, therapy as a part of your self care and just yeah. mm -hmm. good self care overall. Well, I think a lot of people forget or haven't realized that counselors have studied humans more than pastors. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we want to sit with the minister, but he had, I mean, which is phenomenal. Yeah. But the minister has studied theology. Yes. The and the counselor has studied people. So here's a question that I have to ask and then we're, we're, we're ending. Um, where does theology and counseling meet? Yo, I've had I've talked to so many people in the in the yeah, psychology perspective. <laughs> in the psychology, <laughs> psychiatry realm who said, man, um, this is a missing piece of discipleship counseling. Mm -hmm. Um and, and and really this is the problem. Honestly, the problem is this. In the same way that um you know issues of race and racial justice or just justice in general right um and then issues of righteousness so let's let's say we're talking about a cross and it's vertical and it's horizontal mm -hmm. right the vertical is your relationship with god the horizontal is our relationship with each other most people only focus on one aspect of that mm -hmm. so it's just it's me and god not issues of oppression or justice or it's just issues of oppression and justice not you and God. Mm -hmm. And so what had to, what has to happen, what's happening is integration. Well, that's the same thing that's happening with the study of the mind, the, the, the psychology and, yeah. and, and theology. There's not enough integration. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like a band. It's like a band is the keys and it's the drummer and it's the guitar. But the, the drummer's like, yeah, all I need is the drums. That's, the, you know, that's just the, the psychiatrist or psychologist who's saying, all I need to do is focus on the mind. That's mm -hmm. it. And then the keyboardist over here is the, is the church or the pastor. He's like, we just need to pray for it and we're fine. Right. <laughs> and it's like, don't y'all know if y'all work together, it's going to sound amazing. Mm. If you integrate, it's going to sound right. amazing. That's so there's right. not enough integration. And once that happens, when science, science is catching up to the Bible anyway, the Bible right. and people who use it just need to appreciate what's going on in science. And psh, Man, if they could believe for a moment that God really is the creator of everything, um, and so all truth is his truth, if they can really believe that if he's the creator of everything, then he created science as well, uh, mathematics, the whole, um, then you can, you can begin with glorifying him first instead of the practice itself or the, the idea of what this is itself. So I've been in rooms with people who will dismiss counseling or will dismiss um, a, an, another sect because there is, there's a start, they start with them. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I think you start with God first, um, just as scripture does, um, where in the beginning was God in the beginning was him. And you start there and then you begin to engage these other places and you can, through that lens and that framework, start to pick apart and dissect all these different ideas that are being presented to us. Um, in my, it, it, like immediate moments, there have been conversations and, and videos and talking with counselors and therapists about um, this idea of um, we talk uh, neuroplasticity and yeah. the idea of actually changing your mind and how it operates through changing the way you think um, which is why I think medication meditation is key um, both of them both of them <laughs> <too. Medication. clears throat> but there's got to be you got to start with, with God. And, and I think a lot of times, even in moments of justice and conversations of that, like I'm, I'm missing it because I'm starting with looking at Sam instead of the image Sam was made in. Ooh. I'm start, I start there Preach. instead of, instead of going, no, 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 there's, there's a God factor in all of this. Um, and I'm willing to ignore it because of my preference. And yeah. scripture says in James, we, we quarrel, we argue, we fight because we, we don't have what we want. We don't get what we want. Um, and so there's, there's gotta be a relinquishing of, of entitlement. Mm-hmm. Um, no matter the, the amount of letters at the back of your name, um, no matter the experience you've had, uh, good or bad, and there's got to be first starting with in the beginning, God. I just got that letters in the back of your name. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you got letters in the back of your name. You like, and if I could just add quickly, you know, so I think for me, from the perspective of Silence the Chain, it's about um, creating those opportunities to mm-hmm. talk, right, and to collaborate and to fellowship. And so we have partnered with the um, Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, and we are doing workshops now around behavioral health in the faith community. Love it. We've done two wow. already in Atlanta. We have one coming up in Macon and Augusta and Savannah for your fans, you know, that live in yeah. Georgia. And we're mm-hmm. doing, we're sitting down having a workshop where pastors are speaking, you know, mental health professionals, and That's we good. are talking That's about great. how That's do great. we yeah. talk and open up and we integrate living. and work together. Because there are some things that the pastor can help you through, right? So that you can know that you're a child of God and Uh God has a purpose for you and he wants you here. But at the same time, God also wants you to go to the doctor if you need to get help. So how do you talk to your congregation or the people in your faith community about getting the help? So we're doing the work right now. We also have a podcast episode on faith and behavioral health on iTunes under Silence of Shame. So would love to pull you guys in on yeah, that conversation because no. that's yeah, the work sure. that God has us doing right now. So that was the goal of this moment for me. Like we've been talking about integrated living, what that looks like. Um, and I didn't want to get into a room and sit down with five other guys who rap and just say, let's just, <laughs> let's just, let's talk about all the issues. Oh, five. You're one. You're one. You're one. Um, but you know, you're a genie, so it's okay. Um, but you know, I, I didn't want to get in a room with just five other people who kind of come from the same place I come from and say, Hey, let's talk about varying issues as if we're the authority, like mm-hmm. we're the council of it. Um, so integrated living looked like finding somebody who's involved in the trenches, as Sam so eloquently said, uh, with peace prep. And, and it looked like getting like you, like I first heard about you from Cray, but then from there, like, like a little stalkerish on <laughs> social media and then YouTube, you like watching. No, I'm just saying though, no, because it was no one talks, no one says publicly what they're dealing with. Yeah. And so I was like, yo, there's somebody else doing it. Mm-hmm. We're not alone. So I instantly was excited. Like the Breakfast Club interview, looking at um, posts you're making, uh, putting up on Instagram. And I was like, no, it's stuff we're doing. You did the gathering spot, the text. Like, yeah. like nobody's saying this stuff. I gotta, we gotta get her in the room. We gotta get Benjamin in the room. We gotta get Wade in the room. Wade is, I mean, he is. Is the pioneer, bro. That's right. So I'm just like, yo, his his vast knowledge of everything we deal with from this from this genre and, and subculture, but just as a as a, a husband and a father, as activist. somebody who's what you say, activist, an activist, as someone who checked me a couple times back in the day. <laughs> good, good, good. We, need, we should have talked about that. We talked about that a little bit. I wasn't ready. I didn't know where he was on. I, I get it now. I didn't get it then. <laughs> so I'm just saying, like, it was this was a picture of integrated living, so yeah. that so that I'm not just going to voices like mine and I'm not just looking for people who will say yes only mm-hmm. and and we can have a sincere honest open dialogue like ain't nobody had no script or nobody like yo at this moment I need you to talk about you, right. know, right. you know plug here whatever it's legitimately like it's my real life this is what we really live with daily so mm-hmm. as we close T. Dot, can you look in that camera 
and tell someone download <laughs> never fall. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, tell him what? Tell him what? Download the app. He went right in the rapper mode right there. Right the rapper mode. Tell someone who's considering folding <laughs> right now what they need to do and then pray for us. So we've been talking about um, therapy counseling. My my therapist said to me, um, when you when you, when Jesus performed um, the miracle, the first miracle at the wedding of turning water to wine, um, they went to the back and they looked at the workers and they said, "Go fill these tubs up with water." Um, and so this wasn't today; this was then. So they had to get buckets, walk to the well fill the buckets up and come back and fill up the tubs, which was going to take several trips. Many hands make light loads, but they still had to do the work. And then once that happened, Jesus would perform this miracle of taking not grapes, which is where you get wine, but um, water in and of itself and turning it to wine, serving it at this wedding feast, which in this culture would have lasted for seven, eight days. It's this wedding feast where they drink this wine and say, well, this is the best wine I've ever, I ever had in my life. This is this is the best wine. Why would you save it for last? Um, and he said to me, this is when you realize, um, we have a savior who can turn water to wine and not just make wine, but make good wine. Um, God, Jesus only knows how to make good wine. He only knows how to, how to make your life more abundant. He knows how to, he only knows how to bring salvation and mercy into your life, um, grace into your life. The, the reality is, are we willing to do the mundane work? Um, so that he can then change forever your life. Um, for me, mundane work was hard. Um, I was hurt. I, I was a victim. Um, I very much so had issues of, of trauma and pain, um, not just in the moment of grief, but even from the past. Um, and, and I didn't know how to have words to say what I needed to say. And so maybe somebody's watching this and you don't have words. Um, or we're talking about integrated living and you don't have friends and you're tired and weary and you don't want to do the mundane work. But the hope doesn't come in our own efforts. It truly comes first. The, the work is pointless if there's not a savior who can turn water to wine, mm -hmm. who can legitimately give you the good gift of himself in your moment. Um, not just a wedding feast, but in every moment, whether it's a sick child and a they need to get to the daughter before she passes, or it's a sick friend and they gotta take the roof off the joint to lower somebody in, or it's it's the cross where he has to lay it all down in order for us to finally have a relationship with him. Whatever that looks like, um, it only works when we have him. So because he's real, and because we trust in him, um, do the mundane work, find a friend, talk to someone, call a number, see a therapist, Go to your church, talk to your pastor, whatever you need to do to get healthy, um, to get whole. Um, it starts there um, so we don't fold.